seems to be a comprehensive serial killer. He loves the concept of killing. He would want to do it again. I mean, he would bind them up, he would torture them, and then he would kill them. We found uh, the 13-year-old girl in the basement hanging from a water pipe. In that letter to us, BTK said, how many more people do I have to kill before I get some publicity? There may be victims out there that we have no clue of. The BTK strangler hides in women's bedroom closets. He kills women, men, small children. Nobody is safe. Nobody. You can feel the spring storms blowing back into Kansas. This is a live look from SkyTracker in downtown Wichita. Clouds already rolling in, bringing with them the promise of a stormy weekend. This is the story of one of the most extraordinary events in criminal history. A story that has terrorized a small mid-American city for the last 30 years. The conservative city of Wichita, roughly the size of Coventry, is slap bang in the middle of the American heartland. More power to the hour, more bounce to the hour. With a population of just 500,000, the city prides itself on its friendly, peaceful community. But Wichita harbors a dark past that has recently returned. In the 70s, this peaceful community was shattered. Wichita had a serial killer on its hands. The murderer became known as the BTK killer due to the method in which he bound, tortured, and killed his victims. After his seventh victim, BTK disappeared, and for the past two decades, Wichita has tried to forget these horrific events. But in 2004, all that changed. This is Cake News on your side. Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight. A letter sent to the Wichita Eagle is now believed to be from the BTK killer. It's a story that broke first on Cake late this afternoon. Now, the BTK killer hasn't been heard from in decades, but now it appears he may be back. The one thing about BTK that makes him absolutely unique is he's the only serial killer to elude capture for more than 30 years and continue to communicate with the police. What brought him back? Did something change in his life? Did he go on drugs? Did he go off drugs? Did he get married? Did he get a divorce? Did he have a baby? What, what happened in this guy's life to bring him back? This is kind of unprecedented. We don't usually have serial killers out there who wait so many years, decades, to then return and say, ha ha, I'm, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm in your community, and I'm threatening you again. The news of BTK's return has once again plunged the city of Wichita into a state of panic. One man knows more than any what BTK's re-emergence could mean for the community. Now retired, Benny Jawatsky was one of the original detectives to work the case. There was always a feeling, even after I retired, that that was the one case that uh, we weren't able to solve or identify the, the killer. Uh, and then to have him resurface, uh, of course, brought hope again that uh, maybe a new investigation, uh, new forensics, uh, new minds, uh, new detectives on the case, and uh, might bring this to a solution. During the 70s, murders in Wichita were a rare occurrence. But the events of one cold January day would change that forever. On a quiet residential road, 38-year-old Joseph Otero, his wife Julie, 34, and two of their children were bound, tortured, and killed in their home. The Otero killings in 1974 were a huge, huge story. At the scene, it was a small frame home. 
Uh, four people were dead inside when I arrived. The police were combing all over the scene. And it was hard for Wichita's at that point to believe that four members of a family had been killed. That just didn't happen in Wichita, Kansas. So for us in Wichita, this story was huge. Today, the Otero House at 803 North Edgemoor still stands. Bernie Drowatsky was one of the first detectives to arrive on the scene and returns 30 years later to recall the terrifying events that took place there. Well, it's been 30 some years since I've been in this house. It's exactly as I remember it. There was no forcible entry that we could find into the residence on the Otero homicide. Uh, the telephone line had been cut. The best I recall, the bed was to the, to the west. Mrs. Otero was on the bed, uh, kind of at an angle, and Mr. Otero was on the floor. They had both been bound and strangled and were both deceased. It was an extremely uh, upsetting scene to go in and, and find those people, especially the two youngsters. The best of my recollection, this is the room that Joseph was in, on the floor on his back. I believe he was nine years old. He was face up, feet bound. His head was wrapped with uh, the pillowcase and towel, plastic of some type. Further going through the house, we found uh, the 13-year-old girl in the in the basement hanging from a water pipe this is a stairway going downstairs this was where the little girl josephine was found hanging in this basement this pipe was the pipe that the rope was up and over and around her neck. Her feet were so far off the floor. In all of these homicides, there was no sexual attack on any of the victims, but there was uh, semen left at many of the scenes. So uh, I'm sure there's a sexual gratification of some type uh, to these killings. BTK Strangler is a sadist. He loves watching people suffer. When he killed the Otero family, he probably enjoyed very much killing one and having the other family members have to hear their loved one dying. The person who went there had to control four people, had to tie them up and torture them for a long period of time. And this was broad daylight. The killer in this case really spent time watching the house, knowing what was going on. He did a lot of surveillance. He had to know what the family did. He had to know that Joseph Otero, the father, would also be there at some point. Over the period of time that we worked these cases, what did we overlook or what did we miss? Somewhere there had to be a clue that we didn't pick up on. It'd be a blessing to have closure to know that the person responsible for this uh, had been apprehended. It really would. Despite a thorough investigation into their terror murders, the police had no leads and even struggled to find a motive. Once you've committed a crime to this extent, you are a serial killer. A person who commits a crime like the Otero family killing is going to want to go on and do something else. In 2004, the small mid-American town of Wichita was shocked at the news that its most notorious serial killer returned after a 25-year silence. The BTK Strangler, so-called because of the way he bound, tortured and killed his victims, began his killing spree back in January 1974 when he brutally murdered four members of the Otero family. Regardless of who the target was in the first murders, the Otero family murders, we see an element of enjoyment there. This killer really enjoyed killing the family, each one of the, them individually, and he got a sexual release from that. This puts him over into the category of serial killer already, that he loves the concept of killing and he would want to do it again.
On April the 4th, 1974, three months after the Otero killings, police were called to the home of 21-year-old Catherine Bright, who lived just two miles away. Catherine Bright and her brother had returned home, and upon entering the residence, were confronted by an individual that had been waiting in the house. He emerged from her bedroom closet with a gun, told them he was going to rob them. Struggle ensued between uh, Kevin Bright and the individual, and Kevin was bound to a chair. Kevin uh, fought free, grappled with the man, but the man shot Kevin in the side of the head, uh, knocking him unconscious, although the killer thought Kevin was dead. Kevin woke and, f and heard his sister being uh, strangled, being attacked by this guy. He went to her aid, um, and again, then he was shot in the face. Kevin managed to stumble out the front door onto 13th Street, where a passerby found him and called uh, emergency. Catherine Bright had been stabbed three times in the abdomen. Despite police and medical crews arriving at the scene, she died later in hospital. Kevin Bright survived the ordeal, but police felt the extent of his injuries made his description of the killer unreliable. In the months that followed, police received their first breakthrough in the Otero case. Three men openly confessed to the killings, and it wasn't long before the news made the front pages, much to the relief of the community. The police department made some arrests uh, in December of 1974. It was during that period of time that uh, we, the news media picked up on it, and it became knowledge to the, to the community that we had people in custody. And that's when we received our first communication from the Strangler. On October the 22nd, 1974, a man called the Wichita Eagle newspaper and directed them to the public library where they would find a letter hidden in an engineering book. The police were immediately notified and the letter was retrieved by lead detective Bernie Jowatsky. Upon retrieving that letter and bringing it back and reading the letter, we determined that it most definitely was from the individual who had been in the Otero house and had committed all four of the killings. The letter said, those three guys didn't do it. I did it, and here's how you know I did it. He went on to describe in detail what the Otero crime scene looked like. Um, the police realized that only the killer could have known those details. There's some speculation that he actually photographed the scene, all of his scenes, and that's how he kept all these details straight. The letter, filled with grammatical errors, was from the killer himself. He took sole responsibility for the Otero murders and went on to reveal accurate details of the crime scene. The killer spoke of a monster that couldn't be stopped and signed off with a signature that would become his trademark, as well as a chilling promise of further victims. One of the most unusual aspects about the BTK strangling case is that there were communiques with the police. Now, many people watching Hollywood think that all serial killers want to have a cat and mouse game with the police and send them, send them letters, but it is really an extremely rare event. In a desperate attempt to find the killer, police stepped up their investigation, recruiting more officers to the case. But the trail of BTK mysteriously went cold, and it would be another three years before he was heard from again. The next murder would have been Shirley Vianne. Shirley uh, was a single mother living alone with her three children. Uh, as I recall, the oldest child was like eight, and then there were two younger children. Apparently, at one point in time, an individual had stopped one of the children on the street 
and showed a picture of a person and asked if he knew that person or if they lived there. Uh, the child didn't apparently know that, and then later, apparently the same man appeared at the door and gained entry into that residence. Once he was in the house, he pulled a handgun, again, similar to the Catherine Bright murder, told them he was going to rob them, uh, put the children in a bathroom. This is the bathroom that the children were locked in. This door at the time was not here. This was a solid wall. And the kids were placed in here, and the door tied shut in some manner, so they couldn't get out. The oldest child heard what he thought his mother uh, being murdered, which was what was happening. And he helped his, uh, he was eight years old. Uh, there was also a six-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. There was a very small window in the bathroom. There was a window on this north wall and this was a window that the kids used access to to finally get out of the bathroom. When the police arrived, uh, Shirley Vian had been bound and strangled similar to the Oteros. She was found on the bed and there was semen left at the scene. Again, uh, she was not raped or anything, she was strangled. This was a new thing. Uh, and totally, uh, the police did not understand, I mean, why there was semen on Josie Otero, the girl who was hung in the basement. Uh, there was semen uh, near Shirley Vian. So after a while, they understood this was a sexually motivated serial killer. Our theory is that what he was doing is that he was strangling them, and as they were dying, he was probably masturbating at the time. He apparently actually saw the people dying from the strangulation, and that's what aroused him. If the children had not escaped or something interrupted him, I think we'd have had some dead children in that one also. We have since made every effort in the world to you know, work with these children, try to get a description from them. We had child psychologists work with him uh, and everything. As best we could come up with, he was, again, a white male about mommy's age, which would have put him somewhere in your 30s, early 30s, somewhere in that category. We do know that he, uh, that he had a black bag, which we had always theorized that he brought the tape with him that he used, the ropes that he used, uh, and we know he had a gun uh, because uh, we, we theorize in, in the Otero case, he had to have a gun to get control of the adults and things of that nature. We know in, in the Kathy Bright case, he had a gun because he shot the brother. And uh, in this particular case, the youngster was able to tell us. Because of the similarities between the Otero, Catherine Bright, and Shirley Vian murders, Police suspected it may be the work of the same individual, but were baffled by the three-year time gap between killings. A serial killer usually kills after something has gone wrong in his life. He has some kind of crisis. Perhaps his wife has asked him for a divorce, or his girlfriend has left him, or perhaps he's just been fired from his job. He's feeling really low, he's angry at the world, and he says, you don't have any respect for me. You, you don't think I'm anybody. So he goes out and he says, look what I can do to you. He kills somebody, he feels proud of himself, he's got a big ego again, and then he may not do anything again for months and months, or even years, until another crisis appears. And that's why serial killers, they don't kill every month by the moon, like some people think. They kill when they feel a need to kill. As news of Shirley Vian's murder spread, Police Chief Richard Lemonyan faced a difficult decision about whether to go public and warn the community of Wichita that there was a serial killer on the prowl. I'm getting advice at this point now from the FBI, from the behavioral science people. You know, should we release this information? Should we not release this information? And, uh, and you get a lot of different advice, and uh, if you asked six people, you get six different opinions. And finally, you have to make a decision. In this particular case, the decision was made that we would not give him credit for it 
at the time in hopes that he would communicate with us, which he did. But the communication was not what the police were hoping for. About 8.20 a.m. on December 8th, Friday morning, 1977, a caller told a police dispatcher, and his call was recorded, uh, you have a homicide at 8.43 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. He communicated directly with the police department in that he told us, you will find a homicide, uh, gave us the exact location, and gave us her name. Wichita had just started a new system, which was brand new then, uh, now well known as caller ID. So the caller did not know that the dispatcher knew where the call was coming from, and a police officer was there within two minutes, but the caller, the BTK Strangler, was gone. They de then dispatched two officers to 843 South Pershing to check the residence. They did not tell them the purpose of the call. They just wanted the, to check. And I've interviewed one of the officers who was there. He said they initially walked around uh, the house, and in the back, they found the back window was broken and the telephone line cut. And they looked at each other and said, you know what we're going to find in here? We're going to find a body. 843 South Pershing was the residence of Nancy Fox, a 25-year-old part-time secretary. She was found uh, on the bed, uh, face down, which uh, was somewhat typical of what he would uh, do with these victims. Her panties had been pulled down between her buttocks and her knees. There was uh, semen left at the scene in a negligee laying by her head. Nancy Fox's father faced the task of identifying her body. When we arrived at the hospital, they took us into this room and, and wanted us to go make an identification. I mean, it was uh, something you don't want to remember. I could see her face and her feet, and basically it was all. And it was just uh, bruised, black and blue, but enough, it was no no doubt as to who it was. Most serial killers want to simply commit their crime and get away with it. They never contact the police. They don't want anybody to know about it. They're happy if it just disappears and is swept under the rug so they can go kill again someday. Usually to most serial killers, it's a personal thing. It's between them and the victim. That makes them feel like God when they're able to kill somebody. But there are some serial killers out there who want more than that. They like to play games. They like to see that, that they're smarter than the police. After he makes a phone call, he knows the police are rushing down there, and he can imagine them entering the, the apartment and finding what he's done, and that excites him. After the murder of Nancy Fox, BTK's seventh victim, police turned all their attention to the phone call and searched for witnesses to give them a detailed description of the killer. We found one witness that claimed he saw the individual on the telephone making the phone call to the police dispatcher. This was an individual that pulled up to use the telephone, saw a man on the phone, didn't have any change, so he went into the store to get some change for the payphone, came back out to use the phone, and the individual was gone, and the phone receiver was dangling from the phone. And when he picked it up, my understanding was that uh, it was still an open line to the police dispatcher. He gave us a description at that time uh, which was a white male, approximately 5'8 uh, to 5'9, light hair, a very generic description. Unable to release a detailed sketch, the police had nothing to go on. They would have to wait until the killer struck again. By the beginning of 1978, 
The BTK Strangler had viciously murdered four members of the Otero family, including two children, 21-year-old Catherine Bright, 24-year-old Shirley Vian, and 25-year-old Nancy Fox. Despite devoting many officers and thousands of man-hours, the Wichita Police Department were struggling for leads and had still not made public that there was a serial killer on the prowl. In January of 1978, the BTK sent a postcard in an envelope to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. It had a poem called Shirley Locks and was signed BTK. The first line was Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, wilt thou be mine? I think that was what it was. Um, it came into the <clears throat> newspaper and was opened by someone who mistakenly assumed that it was for a Valentine's Day promotion. So they sent it to the wrong department, they put it on the wrong desk, whatever happened, it never made its way up to the newsroom. The poem consisted of seven lines and made reference to Shirley Vian. There was also mention of Nancy Fox. Ten days later, BTK sent another letter, this time to one of Wichita's main television networks, Cake TV. Police are here. I remember going back into uh, the newsroom and uh, several people around the desk. Uh, and I asked about where the letter was or where it had been found, and they indicated to me the letter. Of course, it was uh, handled as evidence and uh, protected for fingerprints and such as that. Because the Wichita Eagle had not published his Shirley Locke's poem, BTK opened his letter with a question. In that letter, he said, how many more people do I have to kill before I get some publicity? And it was at that point that we knew that he wanted publicity, that he enjoyed the publicity, that he really relied on that publicity uh, in order to probably feed his ego. The letter consisted of two typewritten pages, an accurate drawing of Nancy Fox's body, and a poem entitled, O oh Death to Nancy. In the letter, BTK admitted to killing four members of Joseph Otero's family, Shirley Vian, Nancy Fox, and taunted the police to guess a further victim, presumably Catherine Bright. The BTK killer even admitted that he would have killed Shirley Vian's children, but was interrupted. After receiving this letter, Chief Lemunyan was forced to face the inevitable. In that particular time, you're getting all these mixed signals. You know, yes, uh, don't give him credit. Yes, give him credit. Well, in my judgment, uh, we didn't give him credit for Shirley Vianne, and we ended up with Nancy Fox. Uh, I don't know, had we given him credit for Shirley Vianne, that we'd still had Nancy Fox. I don't know that. So I was going to give him credit, which we did. On the 10th of February, 1978, four years after BTK's first victims, Wichita was finally told the truth. Good afternoon. This morning, Cake TV was contacted by the person who police say they believe murdered four members of the Joseph Otero family in January of 1974. The communication came in the form of a two-page typewritten letter addressed to KAKE Channel 10. It was signed with the initials BTK. But with us right now is Chief of Police Richard Lemunyan. I have a couple of questions, Chief. How can you be sure that the BTK letter is authentic? Ron, after reviewing the contents of the letter, there's absolutely no question that the only person who would have the type of information that was included in the letter would have to be the killer himself. Do you know what the, the initials BTK stand for? Yes, it's our feeling that the initials that uh, were placed there stand for bind, torture, and kill. BTK has, sil has killed seven people, Chief. What kind of leads do you have? Well, very honestly, we have no solid leads at all. The press conference was, was actually aimed at two audiences. Uh, number one, the first audience was the community. And number two was to the Strangler. And it was, it was, it was orchestrated for that purpose. Uh, the first idea of a police chief is public safety. 
I mean, we didn't want another murder. So if we could play with this guy in terms of the games that he played and let him communicate with us in writing as opposed to sending us bodies, that was my goal. But the public reaction was one of fear. This sleepy community had never imagined they would be prey to a serial killer. Wichita was plunged into a state of panic. There was not an unlocked door in this community anymore. Everybody locked the door. Prior to that, this had been a community in which you might leave your keys in the car, you might keep your door unlocked. But since BTK, and since there was a serial killer loose, not anymore, everything changed. The reaction of the people in Wichita was uh, panic. Everybody was scared. Uh, everybody looked at their neighbors, uh, locked their doors, locked their windows, checked their phone lines. Uh, it caused quite a stir. The uh, second shift uh, duty sergeant would always send the, the uh, officers out, reminding them the BTK strangler is out there. He hides in women's bedroom closets. He's armed with a knife and a gun. Be careful. The department encouraged uh, people to call the police if they got home and, and felt anything unusual, if they got home and the door didn't look right or a light was off that should have been on or vice versa. We encouraged people to call and have officers come out and do house checks. They'd go through the whole building, the whole house, and the last thing they would do would be fling open that woman's bedroom closet door with their guns drawn. There was never anybody there, but they didn't know that because they knew that this guy would break in and hide in women's closets. Some serial killers like to be the boogeyman. They like to scare not only the person they're killing, but the entire community. These kind of serial killers love a lot of publicity. They like having their stories in the newspaper. Many of these guys will do odd things at the crime scene just to make it look even creepier so that people get more and more terrified and they start being afraid to walk on the streets at night, they're afraid to enter their apartments. That gives them a thrill of not only controlling one crime scene, but essentially controlling an entire city. At the height of the panic, once again, BTK mysteriously disappeared. And it was to be another year before he was heard from again. The Anna Williams case is one of those cases that to me is one of the most terrifying. Uh, for what didn't happen. Annie Williams was a 63-year-old lady, widow lady, who lived alone. And her pattern was, on this particular night of the week, she had a, a regular thing. I can't remember if it was a dancing thing that she went to or bowling or something. And she normally came home uh, when that was over. On that particular night, she chose to stay with her daughter. When she got home early the next morning, discovered that there had been someone who had broken into her house, had spent apparently considerable time in her house. The telephone line had been cut. It was forced entry. Uh, through one of the windows. Uh, it was uh, just a typical residence burglary as far as anybody knew until several months later when a letter was received that had some items in the envelope of hers as well as a letter and a drawing. I won't describe the drawing, but it was, uh, th the drawing that he sent was quite horrifying. Obviously, it goes along with his theme of buying, torture, and kill. And he sent the drawing, uh, the poem, uh, and one of the woman's scarves uh, that she was able to identify as her scarf. BTK's poem posed a question. It also stated that Anna Williams would have been victim number eight. To me, that's very terrifying. And for many, for many women in Wichita, that was an incredibly terrifying moment because all of them could imagine that happening to them and what would they do? It's very scary. Anna's reaction uh, was to the point that she was so upset that she left the state. She was afraid, uh, apparently, that he would come back or keep trying, so uh, she did leave the state. BTK's attempted murder of Anna Williams confused the police even more as they desperately searched for a link between the victims. So you have a victim pattern here of the youngest, uh, Otero, 
who was probably about five or six, and the little girl who was probably 11 or 12. Uh, then you have uh, the parents. You have Kathy, who is a college age. You have Shirley, they're, you know, 20s, early 30s. Uh, you have Nancy Fox. And then you have a 63-year-old. Uh, again, you know, you're getting all this advice from these psychologists and these behavioral scientists, and it doesn't fit anything that they're telling us. Uh, so uh, the only thing that was consistent about this person for over the 30 years is inconsistencies. Desperate for a break in the case, the police took the unprecedented step of releasing the Nancy Fox phone call to the public, which they had spent the past two years trying to enhance. Using state-of-the-art equipment at the time, experts managed to clear up some of the background noise in the aim that someone would recognize the voice of BTK. That was the first time that anybody had heard his voice. And so that was really a momentous occasion. For the audience, it was really a moment. That's BTK's voice. That's the killer. When I heard the phone call there, why well, it was a shock, I guess you might say, or, and a surprise that somebody, a killer would be that cold-hearted to call and notify and tell the police of his own, what had happened and everything in his own words. Despite releasing the voice, no one came forward, and once again, BTK mysteriously vanished. Three years after the Anna Williams incident, police still had no clues to BTK's identity, and the FBI became fully involved. In 1982, the, the federal government started funding a program uh, through the FBI called VICAP, Violent Criminal Apprehension Project. And in 1984, uh, money was appropriated for the Wichita Police Department to work on catching this violent criminal who had not been apprehended, the BTK Strangler. So with the federal money and city money, they devoted eventually uh, up to eight officers to work on this case full time from the summer of 1984 until the summer of 1986. Ghostbusters was the BTK task force, and uh, it was a group of individuals that I put together specifically to work on the BTK case. Their number one priority was to identify the individual, and short of that, to make sure that we had everything that we could do from an investigative standpoint done. They used computers, profilers, DNA testing. As far as I've been able to determine, the first DNA testing done in the United States was in this investigation for the BTK Strangler. Having first focused on the phone call, attention moved to the letters received from BTK. He sent copies of his letters. He did not send originals that he had typed. Uh, Apparently, the copy machines of that era printed an image a little bit bigger than what it saw, so that made it impossible to positively identify a typewriter should a suspect typewriter ever be located. With the help of Xerox Corporation in Rochester, New York, we were able to identify the brand and make of toner and the brand and even the length of the roll of the paper that one of the copies was made from. So we were able to pin it down to one particular copy machine on the campus at Wichita State University which unfortunately for us was a public access machine open to any student or employee or, or person who wandered in there. So at that time it led to some speculation that perhaps he was a student. The second copy machine was traced using the same methods to the second floor of the Wichita Public Library, which was just within a few feet of where the original letter was found in an engineering book. After two years of intensive investigation and thousands of man hours, the Ghostbusters task force came up with nothing and shut down. Just about a month after the investigation had concluded, uh, there was one last murder investigation that the Ghostbusters met to discuss. It was the murder of Vicki Wegerly. And they unanimously concluded that BTK did not kill Vicki Wegerly. It would take about 18 years before they found that they were wrong. 
Wichita's most notorious serial killer has not been heard from in over 25 years. But in 2004, all that changed. On March the 19th, a letter was sent to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. No one could ever imagine what the letter confirmed. The letter contained a single sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper were three photographs and one driver's license. The photographs appeared to be a woman who, with her hands tied behind her back, who appeared to be dead, lying on the floor. The driver's license belonged to Vicki Wegerly. I immediately recognized that name. Vicki Wegerly was murdered in her home in 1986. The case has been unsolved for nearly 20 years. I suspected that what I had was a letter from the killer of Vicki Wegerly. In the Wegerly case, the murderer came in the back door. It was on a very busy street. Uh, she was home. She was a, a mother. The, the, she had a child who was at uh, school. Her husband was at work, and he had a little toddler, like two years old, on the floor. He came in. He got control of her. He bound her, tied her up, left semen at the seam, strangled her, took the car, drove it a short distance away, and left. The investigators on that particular case went to the scene, and at the time they got to the scene, the husband had already been there. The husband found her. He disrupted the scene. He cut her loose. He thought she was still alive. The ambulance was called for. Of course, she was dead, but he, the husband, was doing what he thought was right, and he did. By the time police got to Vicki Wegerly's house on West 13th, her heart had already stopped beating. She died within 15 minutes at Riverside Hospital. Her husband, Bill, supposedly found Vicki with a noose around her neck. Their two-year-old son, Brandon, was playing in another bedroom at the time of the murder. As BTK had been silent for seven years, Vicki Wegerly's husband became the number one suspect. In a case like that, your first suspect is normally the husband. The lead detective, he believed that that was the probability was that it could have been the husband, and he looked that direction. Given that my brother was a suspect, I was asked by the attorneys to talk to the children. Um, in a conversation when I was talking to Brandon, he said, Mommy hurt man. And I asked him at that time, did daddy hurt mommy and he said no so I believe in self-defense that Vicki did try to hurt her killer after a thorough investigation Bill Wegerly was cleared but for the last 18 years a shadow has hung over the Wegerly family Vicki's killer has remained a mystery her body was removed before detectives arrived, so there were never any crime scene photographs taken. The only item missing was the victim's driving license. This proved that the letter received in 2004 could have only come from Vicki Wegerly's killer. The false return address on the letter was from a Bill Thomas Kilman, initials BTK. Further examination revealed an authentic signature used in every communication sent by the BTK killer. When I first heard the news that BTK had returned and claimed that he had killed Vicky, I was elated. And of course then I immensely felt guilty because that didn't seem to be the right emotion. But yet, in my heart, I knew that that meant my brother was vindicated that he, hey, you know, this just puts it on the front page and for the world to know. I thought I'd been writing a history book and that I was coming near the end of writing a history book, but there was a whole new chapter to be written. 
No serial killer has ever come back after a couple of decades of being silent and terrorized the community once again. That to me is the most shocking. What brought him back? One possibility is that he wants to have attention again and he's getting his kick sitting in his house playing this, this new little sick game of his. get a conviction is by having a DNA match. If they don't have a DNA match, this case may never be solved. BTK could be our neighbor. One expert even said that you could be married to BTK and not know who he is. Yesterday afternoon, agents from the KBI, agents from the FBI, and members of the Wichita Police Department arrested Dennis Rader, 59 and a white male, in Park City, Kansas, for the murders. The bottom line, BTK is arrested.